Yeah, okay, so where did the moon come from? Came from the earth, probably this is true, although it's a little more complicated than that. I remember my, my uh, grade school science book gave us some uh, options for where the moon came from. And one of the options was that the moon was captured. It was an asteroid that the earth simply captured with its gravity. And another option was that the moon bubbled out of the earth somehow. And to demonstrate that point, my science book showed a picture of the Pacific Ocean with the moon superimposed on it, because the moon would fit right into the Pacific Ocean. So clearly that's where the moon came from. The problem of figuring out where the moon came from is actually fairly complicated, because the moon is a strange object. First of all, it does not orbit in the plane of the Earth's equator. It orbits in the plane of the solar system. So the angular momentum of the moon is more strongly related to the sun than it is to the Earth. That argues that the moon did not come from the Earth. On the other hand, the orbit of the moon is circular. It's very difficult for a captured body to have a circular orbit. Any kind of captured body would have a wildly elliptical orbit. So how did, it, how did we get this circular orbited object if it didn't come from the Earth? And then you look at the composition of the moon, and the composition of the moon is virtually identical to the Earth, right down to the isotope ratios, with one glaring exception, which is that the moon has no iron, and the Earth is mostly iron. So although the minerals in the moon are very similar to the Earth, it's missing the iron. If the moon came from the Earth, some process must have filtered all of that iron out. And finally, the moon is tidally locked to the Earth. It keeps the same face to the Earth at all times. And that can only happen if the orbit started much closer to the Earth and was pushed outward by a transfer of angular momentum. So what could satisfy all these constraints? And scientists have worked on this for a very long time. And eventually, about 30 years ago, they came to this very interesting conclusion. It turns out that in every orbit, 60 degrees away, there are stable points in that orbit. So if you take a look at the Earth-Moon system and you go 60 degrees away from the Moon, there's a stable point in the Earth's orbit there. It's possible that another body formed, a body maybe the size of Mars. And the, these stable points are metastable. They're not perfectly stable. So if you disrupt an object there, it will start to slide across the orbit until it impacts you. So it's possible that some object roughly the size of Mars, maybe four and a half billion years ago, formed at one of these stable points in the Earth-Sun orbit, got disrupted, moved in and smashed into the Earth, melting both bodies. The two iron cores went to the center of the, one of the bodies, and the, there was a splash. That splash formed a ring. The splash was only the lightweight silicates, none of the iron. The ring coalesced into the moon, and then the angular momentum coupling drove the moon away from the Earth and tidally locked it and circularized the orbit. So that's the current, current theory for what we think about the origin of the moon. Wouldn't it have been fun to be there? To watch an object the size of Mars smash into the Earth and form a ring that turned into the moon. In those days... The, the length of an Earth day was on the order of six hours. And the moon was so close it would have filled the sky. And then the angular momentum coupling drove the moon farther and farther away and tidally locked the moon to the Earth. And the Earth slowed its ra rotation rate down to once every 24 hours. That process is continuing. The moon is getting farther and farther away. The Earth continues to slow down. And uh, it'll take about 11 billion years before the Earth finally tidally locks to the moon. Uh, we don't have 11 billion years left, so we don't have to worry about that. And anyway, we're not supposed to be talking about this. I do want to talk about comments. So a complete change of topic. Let's talk about comments. What is the purpose of a comment? To explain the code that, that you can't use the code to explain. 
Yeah, okay, fine, that's fine. Um, um, the purpose of a comment is to explain the purpose of code if the code can't explain its own purpose. Can code explain itself? Well, generally it can. Now, by the way, it did not used to be the case. Fortran could not explain itself. There was no hope. Uh, one of the problems with Fortran is that, uh, does anybody remember the length of a name, the maximum length of a name in Fortran? Six characters. Right? You could have a name. Six characters long. That was it. And in fact, most languages in the early days had a limit very much like that. I once worked on an assembler that had a limit of four. You can't get a lot done with four. Basic, the original basic, one letter, one number. That was it, A1, B2, K5. Those were your choices. So it's, it's very difficult to get any kind of explanation done when you've got limits like that. Today's languages are remarkably rich. We can have names that are very long. We've got structure in these languages, classes and variables and methods and namespaces. So we've got all these tools that we can use to write code that explains itself. I found this code on the internet. I don't know if it's real. I have seen enough like it to know that it could be real. This is bad, really bad. It's really, really bad hack if you're an employee of Intertrode Communication. Then I'm really, really sorry that you have to maintain this. I was honestly planning on removing this tomorrow, but I've been known to forget things like this. It happens. No, it doesn't. Not if you are a professional software developer, it doesn't happen. You don't put an excuse like this in the code. Now, he might have done something stupid here. I'm not, I'm not worried about the stupid thing he did. He was in the middle of a production crisis, and he had a whole bunch of pressures on him, so he did something dumb. That was okay. The problem I have is that he wrote this comment and made an excuse for what he did and checked it in. And that's, you just don't do that. Do not check stuff like that in. So here's the thing. I can't seem to figure out why the account ID variable isn't set, and I've looked and looked, but I got to leave now. Well, okay, he had to leave. Okay. So anyway, I found that I can just grab the account ID from the debugging logs. <laughs> I suppose that to fix it, you'd have to locate where it's clearing out the ID. Again, I'm sorry. Okay, so... The problem I have with this comment is that it was irresponsibly checked into the production source code control system. I have no real objection to what he did to fix the problem in, a, in a, an immediate emergency. That's fine. But he should never have checked that in. He should never have made this excuse, whoever that person was, and then excuses the fact that he's not going to fix it later. That's a problem. So, I want to talk about comments, and I use that as a preface, but let's talk about the right and the wrong reasons to do comments. Nothing can be quite so helpful as a good comment. I say that up front because most of what I'm going to be doing is ranting about comments. So I want to make it very clear up front that not all comments are bad. Some comments are great. On the other hand, nothing can be quite so obscuring as a bad comment. Comments are not pure good. Many of us were taught that comments were pure good. We were taught in school or we were taught by early, early books that everything should be commented. A programmer should comment everything. Comment, comment, comment. We got to the point that we measured the quality of the code by counting the comments. Which, by the way, it's really easy to make high-quality code if all you're going to do is count the comments. This led to absurd kinds of comments like I++ slash slash increment I. The proper use of a comment is to compensate for our failure to express ourselves in code. 
To the extent that we can express ourselves in code, we do not need comments. But we cannot perfectly express ourselves in code, and so in those cases, we need comments. Every use of a comment represents a failure, a failure to express yourself well in code. And this is how I want you to look at comments. Comments are not the kind of thing that you pat yourself on the back for and say, oh, good, I was a good programmer, I wrote comments. Every comment you write is a failure. Now, you will fail. You will fail to express yourself. You will have to write comments, but you should look at every comment as an unfortunate necessity, not a great achievement. Why? Well, one of the reasons is that comments lie. Now, Nobody intentionally writes, well, I guess some people do, but most people don't intentionally write lie, comments that lie. But comments degrade over time. Let me ask you this. What color does your IDE paint your comments in? Green, like the grass. Oh, gray. Eve, gray is even better. Soft gray, ignore me gray, I can't hurt you gray. I don't bother you gray, I'm just part of the background gray. We paint our comments in colors that are easy to ignore because we don't want to see them. We want to look at the code, we don't want to read the comments. Comments get in the way, so we, we make them fade into the background. Now, I changed my IDE, and I have my IDE paint comments in bright red, big staring, glaring red. Because I figure that if someone wrote the comment, I probably ought to read it. And then if I read the comment and I think it's useless, I will delete it. And that helps me get rid of a lot of comments. Comments silently rot because no one maintains them. We paint them in a color we can barely see, so of course we don't maintain them. And no one reads the comments when they're into the code. They're fiddling around in the code and they're changing stuff around in the code. They don't read the comment that's up here. And so eventually the comment starts to say things that have nothing to do with the actual code. Has anybody seen code? Anybody seen comments that tell you to do exactly the wrong thing? You know, they're five years old, and they tell you, okay, this is what you've got to do, and you read the code. You say, well, if I did that, it would crash. Right? But do we delete those comments? Do we fix those comments, or do we leave them there? Because they're there for posterity. Has anybody seen a comment that has broken loose from the main body of comments and migrated down into the guts of the code, probably, probably through copy-paste operations, where it hangs out there like a piece of junk DNA, just a fragment of a comment hanging out there serving no purpose whatever, but no one will delete it? Comments don't make up for bad code. Now, here's what happens. You write a bunch of code, and you look at the code after you're done with it and think, oh, this is awful. And then you start to write a comment. I better comment it because this is really bad code. I better comment it. No, you should clean it. Don't comment the code. Clean the code. Make the code express your intent. Put the effort into the code. Don't put the effort into the comment. If you finally fail at cleaning the code, then write the comment. Most of the time, however, you will find a way to make the code express itself. Explain yourself in code, not with comments. So here's an example. The, the top says, uh, uh, check to see if the employee is eligible for full benefits. And then below that, there's this horrible Boolean expression. Well, wouldn't it be nice if there were a function called is eligible for full benefits? And then you could say, if employee dot is eligible for full benefits, that reads a heck of a lot better than that comment up there. So. Much better to use the names of functions and variables to explain the code than it is to use a comment to explain the code. Now, I'm going to walk through a set of comments that I think are, I use the word good here on the screen, but that's not quite right. These comments are acceptable, maybe. Um, I would leave them. I would not delete them. And I'll, I'm going to walk through those, and then I'll walk through a batch of bad comments. 
Copyrights. Well, okay. Um, I don't know what you do in the, in the Netherlands, but in the United States, you've got to do this if you want to protect your code. Uh, and you have to have this kind of weird punctuation, so fine. We will leave the boilerplate code up there. Here's a comment. It's an informative comment, and it's really an interesting one. It says, it returns an instance of the responder being tested. And then the function here is responder instance. Now, you could ask this question. Why didn't he call this responder being tested? Why didn't he name it better? Why did he have to have this comment there? And the answer is that he's using a design pattern. What design pattern is he using? Singleton. Yeah, now you might not like the singleton pattern. By the way, who's got the design patterns book? And read it. Hmm. Yeah, good, yeah, okay. And the rest of you who do not have the design patterns book, you must go out and buy the design patterns book and read it and understand it and then come back five years later and read it and understand it again. It is probably the most important book written within the last 30 years. Not because it says anything new, because there's nothing new in that book. It's all about old stuff. And what the Design Patterns book does is it takes a bunch of old ideas that have been around forever and are still around today, and it gives them names and canonical forms so that you and I can discuss Singleton or Decorator or Visitor or Composite. We can talk about those things. And if you know these patterns, if you know if they're in your head, then I can say to you, you know, we could use a visitor for that, and the whole design pops into your head. Oh, yeah, we could use a visitor for that. And we could talk about the design at a higher level of abstraction. We could discuss the patterns that we're going to use to solve a problem. If you are reading code, and you see the word report visitor, and you know that pattern, the design of that code pops into your head. If the author has been faithful to the pattern, the design of that code pops into your head, and all of a sudden you know what to expect inside that code. It's very powerful, very important. Please know your design patterns. There are folks out there nowadays who are saying design patterns were so 1995, and now things are so much more modern, and our languages nowadays don't need patterns. It's complete nonsense. Don't fall for that silly trick. Right? The design patterns are good things to know and good things to have in your head. What happened here is that this guy is using the singleton pattern. The singleton pattern canonical form has the function using this naming pattern, responder instance. So he could not name it a better name, and therefore he used a comment to back himself up. And that was fine. That's a comment that I would leave there. The pattern forced him to use this name. So he could not use a better name. Fine, he can use the comment. Below that, we see another kind of informative comment, which is to do, tell us what this regular expression matches. Now, regular expressions are hideous, horrible syntaxes that no one understands. It looks like gobbledygook, right? You look at a regular expression and your eyes kind of go, whoa. So, it's a really good idea to have a comment telling you what the regular expression is matching. And clearly you can see that his attempt here is to match a timestamp. He's going to match hours, minutes, seconds, and then whatever the heck that is, E, month, day, year. That's probably the time zone, right? So, okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm glad he told me what he expected to match. But do you notice that the regular expression actually matches much more than just that? His comment is lying to me. The regular expression does not just match that timestamp. It matches lots more than that because of these stars. So it's a two-edged sword. He was informative, but he also was telling me a lie. Here's a comment that I would leave. And I, I love the phrasing, right? When programmers write comments, they use such interesting grammar, right? We are greater because we are the right type. I love this, right? This is the imperial we. We are not amused. <laughs> so, okay, what he's trying to tell us here is that 
This is the compare to function in Java, and this is the canonical form of the compare to function in Java, and the first thing you check, of course, is that the incoming object is the right type. Okay, well, what do you return if it's the wrong type? And so what he said here is, look, if it's the wrong type, then I'm going to say that the, this object is greater than the incoming object. We are greater because we are the right type. Okay, fine. I could have probably phrased it better, but I at least understand the intent. I would leave that comment there. I might improve the wording. This is our best attempt to get a race condition by creating a large number of threads. Now, you can see what he's doing here. He's going to create a thousand threads. And then he's going to hope to get a race condition. Now, apparently, he's got some, some multi-threaded thing, and he's expecting some kind of race to happen. Um, this is a terrible way to make a race condition, by the way. If you ever want to make a race condition, you don't do it this way, because this will just set up a nice little resonance amongst all the threads, and they won't race properly. So if you really want to test a race condition, you have to line up the threads right at the race point with some semaphores, and then release the semaphores and let the race continue. So he's using the wrong strategy, but at least he's telling me what he's going to do here. Now, he could have put this into a function named attempt race condition, that would have been better. So I'm questionable about this comment. I think he probably should have put it into a, a better named function. And then, of course, he should have learned how to actually create a race condition. I wrote this probably about nine or ten years ago now. Um, and the comments over here were an attempt to deal with this horrible optical illusion. Code is rife with optical illusions. We line things up in code. There are repeated patterns in code. And they make your eyes twist and turn in strange ways. So it's very easy to create these bits of code that are virtually impossible to see just because of the optical illusion. So you look in here and you say, holy cow, you know, they're all assert trues. At least there's no assert falses in there. And A's and A-B's and B-A's and B's and what the devil is going on? And so I tried to explain over here what the intent of these comparisons was. And it's successful. On the other hand, it's a double-edged sword because a, a reader is going to come along. A person is going to come along and try and read this code. And they will be drawn to the comments and they will ignore the actual code. If those comments are wrong, they'll never see the real code. So that's a bit of a problem. I've struggled with this batch of code for many years trying to figure out a way to get it to be expressive. This is one of those examples where it's very hard to make this code express itself well. Now here the programmer is warning you Don't run that test until you've got some time to kill. And you can see why. You know, he's, you know what is that, uh, 10 million? He's going to write 10 million lines in a file. Well, that's going to take some time. And some of you may remember old JUnit, you know, before we had all those at signs in JUnit. We, uh, the way you turned off a test in JUnit was to put an underscore in front of the name of the test and that would turn the test off. So what he's telling us here is that this is a disabled test, and if you turn it on, you can expect some pretty hefty delays. I would leave the comment in. It seems reasonable to me. This is a comment that I encourage. Uh, you sometimes wonder, you know, what the age was of the people who wrote the Java library and, you know, what, were they kindergarten programmers or something? Because sometimes the Java library is full of code that is, you know, very questionable. This is one of those cases. Simple date format is not thread safe. They've got static variables in simple date format. And if you don't know this and you don't anticipate it, then you're going to get caught in some kind of a, a concurrent update problem. So I always encourage people to put that comment in and say, remember that simple date format is not thread safe, just as a defensive measure. When I wrote this slide, probably six years ago, I thought, 
to-do comments were a really good idea. Now, to-do comments were brand new in IntelliJ about six or seven years ago. And I thought, it's so cool that you can put this to-do in there, and then you can push a little button on the IDE and get a whole list of all your to-do comments. That's just so cool. And now I realize that the word to-do means don't do. I finally understand that. And so now I see code, code that is just loaded with to-do comments everywhere. Nobody ever does them. And so nowadays I have a different rule for to-do comments. I will use to-do comments. I will put them in, but I will not check them in. To-do comments must either be done or deleted before I will check the code in. Because once you check it in, it turns into a don't do. So that's my new rule for to-do comments. I wrote this comment, oh, probably nine years ago. Um, I was working on a system, and I, I needed to put this trim in. Now, trim is one of those functions that it, it occurs so often, people use it so often, and they use it for um, reasons that are ignorable. Because you just call trim on all kinds of things. If it comes in from the outside world, call trim on it. So I wanted to point out that this particular trim was actually really important. It was actually doing something semantic inside the algorithm. So I amplified that with a comment. I didn't want people to just ignore the trim. Do you write Java docs? Now, I think Java docs are fine, you know, especially if you are producing an API for the outside world. If you're going to be writing a whole sub, a li nice library for the outside world to, concern, to consume, then Java docs are fine. But inside the team, if you're writing code that only the team is going to see, you don't need Java docs for that. Because right, the team ought to know the structure of the code anyway, and code ought to have names that communicate pretty well. So I don't like Java docs unless they are for external APIs. And even then, I want them to be pretty minimal. Okay, bad comments. And for this, I'm going to sit. The programmer here was talking to himself. Notice where this comment is sitting. It's in the catch block that does nothing. Now, that's weird all, all by itself. Notice what the, uh, the code is doing. Right? He's got some uh, file that he opens up. It's a properties file. Oh, thank you for that. Oh, that was for me. So that screen is OK. Yep, got it. Uh, he's opening up a properties file. And then he's going to load the properties from, some, from that file. And then there's this I.O. exception that he catches. And he says, no properties files means all defaults are loaded. Where are all the defaults loaded? How, how do I know that's true? He says it here. He asserts it. Yeah, all the defaults are going to be loaded here. I don't know that's true. I don't see the code that loads all the defaults. He's talking about some code somewhere else. And here it is, he's talking about some code that's in some different place. I don't know if that code is still there. I don't know if this is true or not. This helps me not at all. I understand why he did what he did. He's assuming that all the defaults are going to be loaded. But I don't know that that's actually taking place. So I look at this and think, well, this guy was just talking to himself. He was justifying why he was catching the exception and then simply ignoring it. What he probably should have done here is load the defaults. If he'd loaded the defaults here, then I wouldn't have to, we wouldn't have to have the comment. It would be very clear what was going on. But he did this instead. Now, here's a comment that is harder to read than the code. Utility method that returns when this dot closed is true throws an exception if the timeout is reached. OK, now, first of all, it's wrong. It, des it describes the way this function works, but it describes it incorrectly because it, there are ways to return from this, this function that it doesn't talk about. And second of all, it's easier to read the code. You know, while we're not closed and the timeout's greater than zero, then wait 100 and decrement the timeout. That's pretty simple to read. So I think the comment is uh, not only useless, it's worse than useless. This kind of stuff makes me nuts. 
What, what motivated this guy to put a comment in front of every single variable? Not only that, they're Java docs. These are Java docs. And look at them. <clears throat> the child containers belonging to this container keyed by name. Now, first of all, the word container is a strange word, and he can't seem to be can't seem to make up his mind whether he wants to use container or component. So sometimes he uses component and sometimes container. He always capitalizes container. I don't know why. It's just it's a very strange thing. The child containers belonging to this container keyed by name. Well, it's a hash map. Yeah, it's keyed by name. And what's the name of it? Children. Okay, it's a bunch of children keyed by name. I don't need the comment to tell me that. The processor delay for this component, background processor delay. The variable name says more than the comment does. Lifecycle support event for this component, lifecycle support. Container event listeners, listeners. Loader implementation, loader. Logger implementation, logger. All these comments are completely useless. I don't know why he put them in there. I believe he was motivated by some strange urge to comment everything because comments are good. I would much rather those comments be ripped out of there. I already talked about that one. Has anybody seen a coding standard that mandates comments? Thou shalt put comments on every function. Thou shalt put comments on every class. This is stupid. And you must find the per people who wrote those, that coding standard and inform them that this is stupid. Because you don't want to ever mandate comments. When you mandate comments, you get stupid comments. That's when people will write the dumbest doggone things. So here. This is stupid. <laughs> now what really gets me about this one is that this is a Javadoc, right? And the purpose of Javadoc is to run the Javadoc tool to generate the HTML that creates the nice little web page for you, right? That, and if you take that comment out and run the Javadoc tool, it will generate virtually the identical HTML. Because the Javadoc tool is smart enough to look at the class and, and say, OK, Title, author, tracks, duration, and minutes. I would miss a couple of things, I guess. But almost no difference in the HTML, and somebody told me I had to put that kind of crap in there. Long, long ago, in the deep, dark past, when we did not have source code control systems, we would put the journal comments in the first part of the source file. This is something we all did. But nowadays, we have source code control systems. What, what source code control system are you using? Git. Yeah, see there, Git. Good, good. That's the right one. OK, so <coughs> nowadays, we can put all of our journal comments into Git. We don't have to put them into the beginning of the source file. So I hope nobody is doing this. And if, if you find any of that stuff in the source code, you can probably get rid of it now. What would happen if you deleted it? It would still be in Git. You're not going to delete it, right? You delete stuff out of a source file, it stays in Git. You don't have to worry about the fact that, oh, God, I'm going to delete this stuff. Don't do this. Please don't do this. <laughs> it is the dumbest thing to do. It's also insulting. You know, I know that's a default constructor. I'm a Java programmer. Who the hell do you think you're talking to? Now this one, this one's a little bit scary. Right? Because you got that last one wrong. Right? Little copy paste going on here. I found this one in Tomcat, and I was fascinated by it because I still don't understand the comment. It's been years now, right? 
Does the module from the global list mod in angle brackets, I don't know why the angle brackets are there, depend on the subsystem we are part of? Now, I can't, I can't understand that comment. But I was able to use the IDE to extract out variables. So at the bottom, you see how I extracted out the variables. I extracted out module dependencies from smodule.getDepend subsystem. So you can see that here, smodule.getDepend subsystem is there. I extracted that out into a variable called module dependencies. The IDE told me what the type was. So that's cool, array list of module, okay, cool. These are the modules, I guess, that, are, that we are part of, maybe? I don't know. And then I extracted out the other part, you know, subsysmod.get subsystem, and I called that our subsystem, and it, the IDE told me that was a module. And now look at the if statement. If module dependencies contains our subsystem. I love the way this reads. I don't know if it matches the intent of the comment, because I can't, still can't understand the comment. Don't do this. It's stupid. You do not have to yell and then tell me that these are instance variables. Right? I know that they're instance variables. You don't have to do that. Sometimes it is important to yell in a comment. Right? Sometimes you want to do that. Sometimes you are saying something that you really want to attract attention to, and then it is appropriate to put some kind of, you know, big flag in there like this. But if you use that for instance variables, no one will ever pay any more attention to your big red flags. So this is like the little boy who called wolf. Don't do that stuff. It's pure clutter. Does anybody do that anymore? Comments on the closing braces? Remember there was a time that our IDE, well, there was a time we didn't have IDEs. You know, in the 80s when we were, when we were coding in, in VI, with text files, how did you keep track of your closing braces? And this was one of the techniques. But it, it's probably not necessary anymore. This is graffiti. <laughs> you do not have to tell me that you were here. The source code control system will remember. So if we need to know who to blame, we can find out. So, of all the sins of comments, Commented out code is the worst of them all. It is, a, is it an abomination before nature and nature's God? When I see commented out code, I don't read it. I don't try to understand it. I just delete it and get it out of the system. Commented out code is a horror. Now, people get very upset about that. You can't delete that code. Someone might need it one day. Well, if they need it, it's in the source code control system. So they can... Go back and look for it there, but I'm not going to tolerate it sitting in a module like this. Do I comment out code? Yes, while I'm doing experiments, but I will not check it in. I will not check in commented out code. Look at this. What does that mean? Header pause equals byte pause. Did it, first of all, is it code? It's got a semicolon after it, so that's a pretty good indication that it's code. Why is it there? Is there a variable called header pause? I, I don't know. Data pause equals byte pause. I, I don't know why that's there. I'm going to delete it. I'm going to get rid of it. Do not look, put commented out code in. Don't check it in. Uh, this is somebody who um, wanted to write a really pretty Java doc. So we loaded it up with all kinds of HTML macros and crud like that, forgetting that the place you want the comments to be most readable is in the code. The fact that you've got a Javadoc tool that scrapes out HTML and does a nice little print job for you is fine. You can use that tool, but the place you want the comments most readable is in the code. So you don't want to obscure your comments with a whole bunch of HTML and make them unreadable and force people to run the Javadoc tool and then look at it on the, on the web page. If you're going to write a comment, make sure it's readable in the code. For that reason, I don't tolerate HTML in my Java docs. No one can put HTML in a Java doc. You have to use uh, some other mechanism to format it. So I will tolerate a pre and end pre 
in the, in, as the HTML in the Java doc, which keeps all the fonts monospaced. Port on which fitness would run defaults to 8082. It does? Where do I see that 8082? Where here is this 8082? There's a fundamental rule about comments, right? You never talk about code that's somewhere else. If you write a comment, you only talk about the code that's right there. Because if you talk about code that's somewhere else, that code's going to change and your comment will turn into a lie. For the same reason, you never put where used lists in comments. Because those where used lists will change like crazy as well. Here's somebody who simply did not want to write the code. They wanted to write about the code. So they wrote a whole little essay. I hope I drove the point home. Comments aren't bad, but I don't want you writing comments by default. I don't want you in the mindset of saying, I've got to write a whole bunch of comments now. If you're going to write a comment, you need a good reason to write a comment, because what you should be doing is making the code speak for itself to the greatest extent possible. And then if you fail at that, well, then you'll, maybe you'll have to write a comment. How long should a source file be? How many lines should there be in a source file? This is not an easy question to answer. It's not like, you know, the, the one thing, you know, the one rule principle. It's not like that. This is something else. So, so I, I did a little study. I took seven projects that I found off the, uh, off the internet and I analyzed their file sizes, and I found something really interesting. So here's the, uh, the seven projects. One of them is JUnit. This was probably 2001, 2000, maybe 2005 when I did this. Um, and notice that JUnit is like 6,000 lines of code. And the, uh, the plot here is called a box plot. So this is the smallest file. This is the biggest file. This is one standard deviation, and the mean is right in the middle. Right? So JUnit, which is about 6,000 lines of code, has a whole bunch of modules inside it, but those modules, the smallest module is four lines of code. The biggest log module is 200, 300, 500 lines of code. The average module is around 20, 30, 40, 50 lines of code. And most of them are between 100 and 30. That's, that's pretty good. That's pretty standard. Notice there's a log scale here. Right, so as you move up, it changes a lot. Fitness. Fitness is another project. It's about 50,000 lines of code. So much larger than JUnit, but almost an identical structure. This is interesting because you would expect that large projects would have a different structure and have different, uh, different statistical array of, of file sizes, but that does not appear to be the case. Fitness, much larger than JUnit, has the same structure. TestNG. TestNG is a, a tool similar to JUnit. It's got 72,000 lines of code in it, which makes you wonder what the hell it does. Um, and it has a wildly different structure. Interesting, right? So I'm not quite sure what that's about, but the, you know, there's a a big file in there, it looks like 1,500 lines of code. Uh, the average is like 40 lines of code, but there's a huge standard deviation, so he's got no regularity to the size of the files. Time and money, that's about 6,000 lines of code. That's Eric Evans' example of domain-driven design. Um, a very similar structure to fitness and JUnit. JDepend. JDepend is really old. It was probably written in 98, about 7,000 lines of code. And a slightly different structure. Looks like his average file size is about 120. He's got a, a, a couple of big files in there, although they're not really big. It's just that the average seems to be larger than usual. And I think the reason for that is that he Java docked everything. 
And that just drove his file sizes up a little bit. Ant. 200,000 lines of code in Ant. The average file size is around 200 lines. That's pretty big. Now, he's got a couple of big files in there. There's one that's 2,000 lines long. Tomcat, 384,000 lines of code. Look at that. Right? Two, average size is about 200 lines. He's got you know, a file in there with 5,000 lines in it. Now, what I find interesting about this is that there's no correlation between file size and distribution, right? You've got a couple of big ones, a small one here and a big one here and another small one there and a slightly larger one there. They all have roughly the same correlation. We've got really big ones out here, right? And a small one here that, you know, I, there's no correlation there. So what that tells me is that File size is not a function of project size. File size is a style that you can impose upon your system. And since that's true, what style would you like to impose on your system? How big should your files be? And it looks here like you can build a fairly significant system with files that are on the average 50 lines long. Most of them are less than 100 lines. That's probably nice. So that might be a goal to strive for. I'll come back to that stuff because I want to do another statistical analysis, this one. This is an interesting analysis of the length of lines. Same projects, but the length of the lines in the projects. And Look at the interesting correlation here. Every color is a different project, but look how they follow the same interesting curve. Now, this is a histogram. It's a histogram of line length. So this is the number of, this, this is the line length down here. <coughs> and the vertical scale is the percentage of lines that have that length. And notice that the vertical scale is a log scale. So there's a lot of lines that have no length. These are probably blank lines. And, and then they fall off pretty rapidly to a minimum here of about 12. And then there's this gradual climb. Look at, the, look at how tight that's clustered. Right? These are seven wildly different Java applications. But this really tight clustering right in here with a peak. And they all peak about the same place, right around 30, 35, something like that, lines of code, where 1% of the lines of code now are at this level. And then it starts to fall off. And this looks like a slow fall off, but this is a log scale, so it's actually a very rapid fall off. And you get to about here and realize that nobody wants to see any lines that are longer than about 80. Right. So this is the interesting part of that curve. And what I find fascinating about it is that, it's, that all seven of these projects follow the same curve. So it seems that we have a preference for lines that are on the order of 30 to 40, line, 40 characters long. Is that a change in? Well, so that's interesting. Yes, lines, the screens are getting bigger. Is that having an effect on our line lengths? And this argues that it's not. Because look at how, look at how small that is. That peak sits in there right around 40, 35, 40. Right? So, the fact that our screens are getting bigger does not seem to be affecting the distribution of line lengths. I find that to be very interesting. Now, what does it tell us about what kind of guidance does it give us? Well, I think the guidance is pretty obvious. You want your lines to be on the order of 30 or 40 characters long. You don't want very many that go beyond maybe 80. I actually have a, um, a barrier put into my IDE at 150. I will not go beyond 150. And I do that because I believe it is rude to make your readers scroll to the right. So all the code should fit on the screen, and you should not make your, your readers scroll to the right. If you make them scroll to the right, they won't. And then you can hide all kinds of crap out there. Yeah? Do they have different functions? 
Yeah, I don't know. I didn't do that analysis. It's an interesting, interesting thing to do. We have an awful lot of code now, so there's very interesting analyses that we can do like this, but I didn't do that one. Anybody else have a question on this? Good, okay. So then let's talk about names. Let's see, where's our names? That goes to about here. There we go. Early in programming, we didn't have a lot of options with names. Like I told you before, we were limited to like six characters. Nowadays, that limitation is long gone. So we can have names that are as long as we want. And we name things. We do a lot of naming in software. We name files and directories and programs and classes and namespace and variables and arguments. We name all kinds of things. And because we do so much of it, we probably ought to be good at it. So let's talk about some rules for naming things. The, uh, the rules that I'm going to show you here are old. They've been around for a very long time. They're derived from Tim Ottinger's list of naming rules that uh, has been very popularly circled around the internet for years. Very obviously, you want to reveal your intent in a name, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples here. Is int d a good name for elapsed time in days? Now, your original thought would be, well, no, of course not, because d is just a one-letter name. That's awful. But wait a minute. How long should a variable name be? What's the rule for the length of a variable name? Now, consider the for loop. For i equals 0, i less than 10, i plus plus. Do you want that i to be something other than i? The answer to that is probably not. And so there, is, there does seem to be a place for single letter variable names, like i. So what's the rule? What is the rule? for the length of a variable name. And here's the rule that I use. A variable name should be proportional to the size of the scope that contains it. If the scope is very small, like one line, a single letter is fine. You don't want to have anything else. You know, if it's a one-line scope, you don't want to have anything else. A single letter is great. D would be a perfectly valid name for a date if D existed only in a single line because you wouldn't lose the context. You wouldn't need the name to remind you of anything. The function call that generated the name would be enough. Long scopes need long names. So let's walk through the hierarchy here. Inside of a, an if statement, you've got maybe a couple of lines in that if statement. Variables inside that if statement ought to be very short. Variables inside of a really tiny while loop should be very short. If you have a function, and that function is four lines long. The variables inside that function should probably be pretty short. Because it's four lines long, maybe they'd have to be a little bit longer. Arguments would probably be a little bit longer. A, a word would probably be good for an argument. Instance variables live inside a class. They have a slightly longer scope. They have the, the scope of the class. So probably an instance variable should be long-ish, two words maybe. Functions, uh, the arguments to a member function, probably a word. Global functions. Global functions have a huge scope. They better be very long. Uh, global variables, sorry. Global variables have a huge scope. So they should probably be very long. Variables should have a length proportional to the scope that contains them. What's the rule for functions? Exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. The bigger the scope, the smaller the name for a function. And for very obvious reasons. We would not want to call the open function if the name of the open function was open file and throw exception if not found. As, a, as the scope of the function gets larger, we want the name to shrink. We want the name to shrink because we're going to call it more. A function that lives in a large scope will be called from all over the place, so we want to shrink the name down. Moreover, 
If the function is in a large scope, it must be abstract. It must be dealing with a high-level abstraction. So we want the name to be short. As the scope containing a function decreases, the name starts to get longer. So the instance, instance methods of a class will probably have slightly longer names. Private functions called by public functions will have even longer names. Private functions called by private functions will have even longer names. You can continue down that hierarchy for a very long time, especially if you're extracting until you drop, because you'll extract and extract and extract, and all these extracted functions are going to be private. And every time you go down another level, the name gets longer and longer and longer, and it gets longer because the function becomes more precise. It does something really tiny, really precise that you need words to specify. So. The name of a function is inversely proportional to the size of the scope that contains it. What about classes? Same as functions. Size of a class name is inversely proportional to the size of the scope that contains it. Classes at the global scope have one word names. Derived classes have multiple word names. Inner classes have multiple word names. As the scope shrinks, the name grows. So that's a reasonable rule for naming things, or at least controlling name length. Therefore, int d is not necessarily a bad name for this variable as long as the scope that it was contained in was small. If the scope was long, then elapsed time in days is perfectly reasonable. What does that function do? Take a look at it, spend a little time. It gets them. What does it get? Well, it walks through a list and it interrogates the first element of each list. And if that first element is a four, then it adds it to the output list, list one, which it returns. Excellent, good, now we know what this does. It scans a list for first elements for elements whose first element is a four, and then it returns only those lists that have that. Okay, good. I think I got that right. That's the same code. But this changes everything. The, the names here tell you what's going on inside this function. It's getting all the flagged cells. Oh, there are cells. And the cells are part of a game board. And every cell has a status value. And if that status value is flagged, then we're going to return that cell. So this function returns all the flagged cells. Now notice what this, this naming system does. This naming system does more than just make it easier to understand the function. It also tells you what program contains the function. This program is in some kind of a game. This function is in some kind of a game. Probably Minesweeper, if you know Minesweeper. Of course, nobody knows Minesweeper anyway because nobody has that old desktop accessory from Windows anymore, but okay. A good system of names tells you not just about the function you're working on, but it tells you about the entire context of the system. So that's the, the power of a good system of names. Let's see. You got to watch out for this. What's the um, first place where these two variables differ? Now, some of you probably got fooled by that because it's really hard to see. Code is full of optical illusions, and you have to be very, you have to be cognizant of the fact, you have to be aware of the fact that code can contain optical illusions, and you have to fight against that. This is really hard to see. You're going to be looking out here, especially because of this. Right? And you also have to worry about stuff like this. Our, our modern IDEs have gotten pretty good at disambiguating 1 and L and 0 and O and P and Q, but sometimes these letters and symbols differ by one pixel. So you have to be careful about that. Sometimes it's hard to dis differentiate them. Do you use prefixes anymore? Like um, 
the and uh. I used to use this, this, uh, this convention. Um, all of my local variables began with a, uh, the indefinite article here. All of the arguments to a function began with the. And all instance variables began with ITS, its. So its name, its date. I used to use that all the time. I, I've stopped using that now. I used to use it in the 80s and in the 90s, but I've stopped using those prefixes now because the IDEs are just so good at telling me that that's an instance variable or a function, I can hover over it. So I've kind of dropped the whole prefix idea nowadays. It's probably not a good idea to use number series like this. Sometimes you have to fall back on it, but it's better to give them reasonable names. Number series aren't a great idea. Watch out for noise words. Data and info. Data, first of all, I want you to realize data is completely redundant. Right? Of course it's data. You don't need to say it's data. Right? Product. And now, here, what is the difference between product and product data? Is there some, is there, does this tell you anything about what, what is different about it? There's a type in this system called product. There's another type in this system called product data. There's yet another type in this system called product info. What is the difference between them? And these type names don't tell you the difference. So that's a problem. Those are noise words. I'm not going to talk about that because I'm going to come back to it later. This I found in a, a real application, and I find it scary as hell. The, the first line says, there's a function that will return the active account. Get active account. That's great, and it returns an account. Good. But now look at the next function. Get active accounts. This is in the same system. Now that begs the question, what the heck is that first one returning? Because there can be more than one active account. So what's the first one returning? The third function is even scarier, get active account info, but it returns the list of accounts. So these are not well disambiguated names. The names are not telling you what's going on here. And you look at them and go, oh, what? That's not good, that's a WTF. Make sure your names are pronounceable. Um, Booker Threekant, Pizzy name, Jinya Mudhims. Now, you, you can see why, the, the last one especially, you can see why he used this name. It's the generation timestamp, year, month, day, hour, minute, second. Makes perfect sense, but you can't say it. Now, you know, do you guys pair program? What? Any pair programmers out here? Anybody pair? How often do you pair program? Not very many people doing it. Why not? It's a good idea. Pairing allows you to share knowledge. Do you do code reviews? Who does code reviews? Who? Everybody does code reviews. Code reviews are very inefficient. Pairing is very efficient. Right? How much, how much time should you spend on a code review? Let's say that the original author required five hours to write the module. How long should it take to review that module? Well, some function of five hours, maybe not exactly five hours, but some significant function of five hours because if you're going to review the module, you need to walk through the reasoning that the author originally went through. Now, hopefully the author made that easy for you by refactoring it and cleaning up the code, so fine, but it's still going to take you some fairly significant amount of time to review that module. If you, if you review a module that took five hours to write and you review it in 15 minutes, all you've done is look for semicolons. That's all you've done, right? Maybe it's some indenting and maybe a few naming conventions, but you haven't done anything significant. You haven't actually reviewed the code. So you should look at code reviews as requiring roughly the amount of time it took to write the module. Well, okay, if you're going to spend that much time reviewing the code, why wouldn't you pair? Pairing takes about the same amount of time, but when you're pairing, you are actively involved. You are not passively reviewing, you are authoring. There's a much better way to share knowledge and contribute to a team, yeah.
So the, the question was about noise words, because he didn't want to talk about pairing. <laughs> um, the word exception appears in lots of different types in Java. You know, illegal state exception, illegal argument exception, null pointer exception, and so on. Does the word exception uh, constitute a noise word? In that case, no, it doesn't. It's the, it's the noun that is the base class. They all derive from exception, and then the derived classes have to add a word onto that to describe what kind of exception they are. So that's not a noise word. And, and it, it is not noisy also because it tells you it's an exception. All right, now back to this pairing thing. Thank you for that. Okay. We have to uh, go out for lunch? Oh, yeah, it's 12.30, isn't it? It's 12.30. See, he doesn't want to talk about pairing either. No, I don't. Yeah. <laughs>